Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I'm Tammy Farber. I'm uh, an environmental law partner in the Toronto office of Miller Thompson. And on behalf of Sidley and Miller Thompson, welcome and thanks for joining us. Our topic today is doing business in Canada and the United States, specifically navigating environmental, regulatory and business risks. And I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel discussion. So let me introduce today's distinguished panelists. First from Sidley, um, and we'll have a little high and a wave uh, from Andrew Stewart. He's a, medley, a member of a Sidley's Environmental Practice Group, which is a highly ranked uh, Chambers USA national firm. And uh, it has a band one ranking in the District of Columbia. He is a former senior official from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and he helps clients solve a broad range of compliance and enforcement issues, focusing on complex, high-stakes environmental matters with an insider's knowledge of the regulatory process. He has over 20 years' experience in environmental law and handles matters arising under all major federal environmental and state laws, including the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Joining him from Sidley, Marshall Morales is a senior managing associate, also in Sidley's Environmental Practice Group and based in DC. He helps clients in energy, technology, manufacturing sectors. Again, environmental liability and litigation and government enforcement actions is where he plays best. Uh, he is recognized as a young leader in environmental law and received the Best Lawyers One to Watch Award in 2021 and 2022. From Miller Thompson, my two distinguished partners, uh, Brian Buttigieg. He is recognized as one of the leading practitioners of environmental law in Canada and is certified by the Law Society of Ontario as a specialist in environmental law. He is ranked highly in Chambers Canada and his practice includes a combination of litigation and transactional advice involving um, regulatory defense representations in environmental and occupational health and safety matters. He represents corporations uh, in uh, sale, purchase and use of contaminated property. He provides advice regarding claims for environmental damages, cleanup costs, loss of use, loss of market value and negligent misrepresentation. He's also a trained mediator and a panel member of the Canadian Centre for Environmental Arbitration and Mediation. And certainly, last but not least, Sarah Hansen from our British Columbia office in Vancouver. Uh, Sarah's legal expertise is in commercial litigation and regulatory compliance. She's represented individuals, government, industry, and First Nations in a wide variety of matters. Uh, with over 20 years of practice, she has specialized in um, Aboriginal and environmental law, involved in complex commercial litigation matters, on energy projects such as fossil fuel and renewable renewable energy and uh, administrative law matters. She has been involved in wind energy, forestry, electricity, mining, oil and gas, ecotourism, composting, biogas, run of river hydro projects, and has worked extensively with regulatory authorities. And so without further ado, um, we're going to um, now get into the program, the meat of it, and um, one little logistics issue. If you do have questions as we go along, um, please put them in the uh, Q&A box and we will uh, leave some time at the end and try to answer your questions at that time. Um, so what are we going to cover today? Well, um, we're going to cover an overview of regulatory liability in both the U.S. and Canada, specifically environmental regulatory liability. Um, then we're going to look at some enforcement, uh, drill down on some enforcement issues. We're going to look at strategies to respond to those issues and some emerging trends. So let's get right into it. And we're going to start with Andrew. And Andrew, help us understand how environmental liability is treated in the United States. Sammy, thanks. Uh, happy to do that. Let me say first, this is a real pleasure for me. Um, I uh, grew up in Northeastern Ohio, went to Lake Erie a lot, and as my folks would tell us, 
we could look across the lake to Canada. And of course, our standard trip was to pile into a station wagon and go to Toronto, see the Science Center. So I'm particularly excited to dialogue with you, Brian and Sarah, today about these important issues. Uh, what I'm going to try to do when I cover these topics today is bring an insider's perspective as a former EPA enforcement official. How does the agency look at these issues? What drives their decision making? And of course, how can we effectively respond to uh, enforcement matters and other regulatory issues coming from the government? So um, let's start first to address your specific question with a liability spectrum graphic here. This is um, something we typically use when we explain at a high level how liability works under U.S. environmental laws. Tammy, uh, please, of course, understand this is a simplified diagram to show a continuum in terms of actions and state of mind and the potential consequences in terms of environmental enforcement. So if we start from the left, we have um, strict liability uh, as we would call it in the U.S., which typically involves civil fines. The concept here with strict liability and civil liability is the act itself of violating an environmental law is enough to trigger, trigger liability. So whether it's uh, failing to comply with permit terms, discharging without a permit, uh, or air emissions that aren't authorized by a permit, or failing to submit reports, the act itself is enough to trigger liability. Now, if we move rightward under U.S. environmental laws, we verge into criminal territory. Of course, note that uh, as we move rightward, a particular act or series of acts could also give rise to civil liability. But the U.S. environmental statutes have a mix of criminal, criminal triggers, ranging from negligence to knowing conduct to willful, as we go far right. And in those instances with criminal penalties, the statutes provide for various different levels of financial penalties, but also imprisonment, depending on the statute, depending on the circumstances. So, of course, this is going to be very law-specific and fact-specific. Let me also say, too, that when we're in the, in the left part of the graphic here, Tammy, and civil liability, strict liability, the US EPA and state agencies have penalty policies. So they are going to assess, even in just fashioning a civil penalty, they're gonna assess things like the length of time the violations have occurred, the state of cooperation, is the company uh, seen as a cooperative actor in engaging on enforcement issues, and other factors that we call gravity here in the US. So there is going to be a consideration of the conduct just fashioning civil penalties. And that's something that they look very carefully at when they turn the knobs, so to speak, in their penalty policies to come up with a civil penalty. So on the criminal side, though, Tammy, what are U.S. EPA investigators really looking for in assessing potential criminal liability and in developing a case? What, what's the sort of fact pattern that gets them excited to pursue possible criminal issues. Well, you know, for them, uh, a great case would be facts showing a conscious decision within a company to evade environmental controls to save money. It's a high bar and it takes a particular fact pattern. But what happens here, Tammy, is that the civil teams going about their business will exchange tips fairly routinely with criminal investigators. And the criminal folks are looking at, well, can we get this in front of a grand jury? Can we prosecute this? And so if they, if they have facts showing that there was a clear decision made by some people, a person within a company to say route around pollution controls, if it's a discharge or make false statements to regulators, then that will get them looking into whether there can be a criminal case. And of course, they're also gonna look at things like are there documented environmental impacts associated with this? Where, was there a fish kill? Was there runoff that uh, caused impacts to vegetation, and then moving again, rightward in more severe conduct, were there injuries, were there fatalities? So these are the kinds of factors swirling around that are going to influence whether a criminal investigation team at US EPA or state agency decides to move forward. A big focus I should call out for everyone has been 
the use of a provision in the U.S. called 18 U.S.C. 1001, which really prohibits providing false information to the government. The criminal teams here in the U.S. have increasingly been relying on that provision to pursue criminally uh, folks at companies where they believe there's been a submittal of false information to the government. Now, with all this backdrop, what can you do proactively if you suspect that someone inside your company has engaged in conduct that could encroach on negligence or the more severe forms of conduct that could trigger criminal liability? Well, first of all, if you've got an environmental management system in place and you're doing internal auditing, you may surface this issue proactively. In fact, we often work with companies to help initiate internal investigations that are conducted under privilege that can involve interviews with current and former employees to really get to the bottom of whether there's a criminal issue. And then we can advise leadership and the board if necessary about that. Of course, um, it may be warranted to brief employees, prepare employees that they may be contacted by criminal investigators. And criminal investigators have particular techniques they use, like they, they like to visit during dinner time. They show up in pairs of two. They like to catch uh, employees off guard. So there are standard ways that we can brief and prepare employees for those kinds of visits so that everyone uh, knows what to expect. And then depending on where things lead, Tammy, of course, there can be an evaluation about whether an employee or a group of employees need to have their own attorneys provided. Uh, based on where an investigation may lead. So anyway, that's an overview as well as some tools that we like to, to use if we believe that there's a, a specter of a criminal investigation. Thanks. That's that's super helpful uh, to talk about from the U.S. perspective. We have some Canadians on the line as well. So, Brian, let's go to you. And is there a similar approach to environmental liability in Canadian jurisdictions? Thanks, Tammy, and, and again, thanks everybody for uh, participating in, in this. Um, there is a similar approach, and I'll, I'll pop up a slide here, uh, with some differences. Uh, so there, it's uh, conceptually, we are, uh, it, it, it is a similar approach in that the type of proof that is required is going to increase with the, with the degree of alleged culpability in the end. But we have some terminology differences that can get a little bit confusing. So I'll, I'll work our way through this and I'll point out where things differ, differ from, the, from the US because sometimes when we're having conversations cross-border with clients or with other law firms, uh, we can get hung up on some of these words and not realize that we're talking about different concepts but using the same labels. So first of all, the most serious type of offense um, uh, in terms of uh, liability uh, for an environmental matter would be, would be a criminal offense. Now in Canada, criminal offenses is a very narrow definition. It is really just offenses that are listed within a particular statute called the criminal code, uh, which is a federal statute and, uh, and is enforced federally. It is quite rare to see environmental matters prosecuted under the criminal code. Uh, and one of the reasons simply being the degree of proof required. It requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt of the act and proof beyond a reasonable doubt of some level of intent. Uh, which, which can get quite complicated from a prosecutor point of view, especially given the various other tools that are available to them to, to enforce um, environmental matters. So at the heart of our system and sort of in the middle ground is what we would call up here regulatory offenses or strict liability offenses. And this is a key label that's worth keeping in mind because what Andrew described as strict liability is not what we would call a strict liability offense in Canada. A strict liability offense in Canada would be an offense in which the prosecutor still has to prove the act beyond a reasonable doubt. But then this unique common law defense uh, comes in, uh, in which the defendant is now uh, has available to them to prove on a balance of probabilities that they took all reasonable care to prevent the particular act from occurring. This is was originally a judge-made defense uh, as a way of sort of trying to introduce some fairness. And it was introduced initially in England, adopted in Canada, and we now actually see some statutes that specifically uh, write in to the statute this strict liability defense of what we call due diligence. Uh, but even if it's not written in there, uh, it, is, it is taken as a matter of law that it is always available in a regulatory offense uh, of this nature. And then down the list of, uh, of culpability and proof, 
uh, you have what are called violations up here. And these would be parallel to what Andrew calls strict liability offenses in the US, where the only thing that needs to be proven is that the act occurred. Effectively, the only defense you have is to say it wasn't me, that it was somebody else at the end of the day. Um, proof uh, that the act occurred is all that's needed. And the penalty is typically uh, it's, it is a fine with some ability to negotiate that fine at the end of the day, um, if, if you can show certain uh, mitigating factors. Generally, those, those violations, we call them administrative monetary penalties is another label that you'll see used uh, up here, uh, are tend to be run of the mill type offenses uh, or type of violations, uh, usually with relatively small environmental consequences. And then finally, within this uh, spectrum of liability, um, there is obviously the ability beyond uh, enforcement by the regulators. There is civil liability, which typically we consider things like negligence uh, or, 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 or some types of intentional torts. But generally speaking, with, uh, with civil liability, it's open to a plaintiff to allege damages uh, if they can prove negligence on a balance of probabilities. And what's interesting here is that the defenses that one would advance to a negligence case are very similar to the defenses that one would advance uh, in defending a regulatory offense and a strict liability. So that's basically our spectrum. And the main thing to take away from this, especially if you're dealing with cross-border issues, is that uh, if you're using strict liability as a label, make sure you understand how it works in, in the two different jurisdictions. So Tammy, back to you. Okay, thanks, Brian. So a couple differences to start. Let's go back to Andrew, and I promise we will get to uh, to Sarah and Marshall. But are there different approaches um, when you're talking about state and federal enforcement for environmental violations? Yes, uh, there are, Timmy, and um, I can sort of talk about this at a structural level, uh, our system of federalism here, and then talk in more um, granularity. Uh, first of all, maybe a little bit of history in, in the U.S., uh, as folks may know, some states like California had significant environmental programs here uh, to regulate things like vehicle emissions before U.S. EPA even existed. In fact, uh, in California, the California Air Resources Board was established in the late 1960s under then Governor Ronald Reagan before U.S. EPA was established under the Nixon administration. Um, and then in the U.S. at the federal level, many of the federal environmental laws as we know them in their modern form were enacted in the 1970s. So there, there are some instances where states were out ahead in certain areas of environmental law before things came online at the federal level here in the states. I would uh, recommend an excellent book that I'll, I'll uh, plug here called Cleaning Up America. Um, that was written by a former um, political appointee at US EPA when it first was created in the early years that tells a fascinating story about how the government decided to create a, a federal agency dedicated to enforcing environmental laws and the tensions between doing that and the states that were already regulating in some cases. So um, how are the states different to get to the heart of your question? Um, in, in our system, many of the federal environmental laws and programs uh, authorize states to implement them primarily Tammy, like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act in many cases. So for your facilities out there in the states, um, your teams, your environmental compliance leads and others who support environmental compliance are going to be interacting with states and local jurisdictions in most cases. And so their job in part is to cultivate relationships with their state. Because, for example, if you're running a chemical manufacturing plant or refinery that's heavily regulated under the Clean Air Act, you're gonna be submitting permit filings and working on permit amendments and dealing with compliance issues primarily with your state. EPA's role in all this, if it's an authorized program like the Clean Air Act, is to backstop where EPA would say that, well, federal involvement is needed in a particular case. And so what happens sometimes, Tammy, is the states will address a compliance issue and work with a facility and get to a point where they feel like we need to refer this to the EPA region that has jurisdiction over the facility because our actions haven't led to sustained compliance yet. And in fact, there's this sort of general concept in play here in the US that EPA will stay out of the matter if it's an enforcement case if the state action is timely and appropriate. So if the state's 
which is on the front line, is doing its job to monitor compliance and take any follow-up enforcement actions, you know, there may not be a role for EPA there if it's an authorized program. So being mindful of that concept and dynamic and making sure that folks at the facility level are really, really taking care of those relationships with their states and also their EPA regional folks, that's critical to making sure that you're out ahead if any facts lead to um, an enforcement matter. And so that's a, a really bread and butter work that the facility level folks may need to be doing. And I'll talk in a little bit more detail later on about the EPA enforcement priority scheme versus how states set up their, their enforcement resources. But, you know, if we step back, it's sort of like a family, right? It's a, a regulatory family. EPA and the states are ostensibly working together to support each other. Sometimes there can be tensions in that relationship like with any family, sometimes you might even say it gets dysfunctional, but for your folks who are really in charge of operations out there in the field, they need to really understand that dynamic, know all the players in the state and the regions and make it part of their business to cultivate strong relationships. Um, because in many cases, Tammy, if you have strong working relationships with states and EPA as well, you can resolve compliance issues short of formal enforcement because you're operating in a high trust mode, right? There's goodwill in the bank, so to speak, that comes from investing in those relationships. I think that uh, we'll come back to that that concept, uh, and I, I'll, I'll come back to, to everybody on that concept of relationships. Uh, Brian, let's come back to you, and, and is there a difference uh, similar to what Andrew was describing in Canada about federal and provincial approaches to enforcement? Uh, thanks, Tammy. It, it, it is similar, but again, uh, the difference uh, really is rooted in, in our history and in our constitution in that uh, in, in, in the Canadian uh, ju uh, judicial system, uh, powers uh, for, for legislation uh, have been provided within our Constitution Act from 1867 when it was written, uh, and a list uh, was created, a list of powers that are exclusive federal and a list of powers that are exclusively provincial uh, for, for jurisdiction. And, and of course, it was written with the spirit of what was known what was considered to be important in 1867, uh, which, for example, gave railways and the postal service to the federal government uh, and gave something called property and civil rights to the provinces. And of course, didn't specifically list the environment uh, in, in any particular way. The net effect is that environmental regulation is shared by both the provinces and the federal government and is shared by effectively trying to fit it into some of the existing powers, such as, for example, the criminal law power uh, or the federal government power to make treaties or to deal with international trade and the provincial power, which has grown to become an all encompassing power of this concept of property and civil rights. So. In effect, what that means when it comes to day-to-day -day working with our regulators is that you would see more federal environmental activity on the coasts and where we have international borders, including the Great Lakes region, um, and, uh, and dealing with issues such as uh, maritime and, and marine pollution and marine uh, regulation. On the other hand, really the day-to-day -day enforcement within most of the country really comes down to the provinces and the provincial regulators. There is extensive provincial uh, legislation unique to each province, but with similar concepts of responsibility for people that have care and control over environmental matters. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, most, of our, uh, most of our dealings uh, for, our, for our clients are going to be with provincial regulators um, unless, again, you, you would hit one of these areas where, where you're going to see um, a, a federal. And so, for example, Sarah, who we'll hear from later, will probably in her day-to-day -day work deal a lot more with federal regulators than I would in my day-to-day -day work here in Ontario, where other than the Great Lakes, um, the, 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 the feds don't really put in a, a lot of attention on an enforcement side. Um, so that's that's a that's a bit of an overview, Tammy, of how the the federal and provincial um, division takes place on the environmental. Terrific. Okay, so so let's go to Marshall now, and um, let's talk about some tools, enforcement and defense tools used in environmental prosecutions. How is is that working in the United States? Sure. Thank you, Tammy. And let me just echo what Andrew said. We're really pleased to join our friends at Miller Thompson today. Uh, I think there are two really important tools that EPA uses, uh, aside from penalties, is uh, 
Andrew already discussed, and those relate to how EPA deals with ongoing violations and also how EPA collects information. So in terms of stopping ongoing violations, most environmental statutes give EPA pretty broad powers, uh, at least in name, to seek injunctive relief either from a court or through administrative orders uh, on its own. And some of those, even in a, in a uh, site remediation context, some of those are subject to a bar on judicial challenges. Uh, so on the statute books, EPA can have pretty strong authorities. Um, these can be a stop sale order on products, they can seize imports, or they can order corrective action. Uh, but many times EPA doesn't use these directly and instead they use them as leverage to seek a negotiated uh, resolution. And that's often because EPA may be looking for, say, particular PPE or safety changes, water protection, uh, that it can't get quickly out of a court necessarily from just in order to stop a violation. So often EPA is looking for how do we use leverage of the authority we have on the statute books to get something more than what a court could order. And that kind of negotiated resolution can be pretty beneficial to the company as well, it can help avoid uh, business disruptions, and it also can avoid unexpected uh, public scrutiny or media coverage, which can give you more time to develop either adjusted business plans or a communication plan if that's needed. Uh, and then as to how EPA collects information, that's another area where EPA has pretty strong authorities to seek uh, administrative information requests or even go um, through the Department of Justice for more formal uh, investigations. It's similar there, we often see EPA approaches a company and indicates that it's seeking information and you can reach a more informal uh, relationship that can be pretty productive because often EPA doesn't understand uh, just by the nature of it, they don't have staff that understand the depth of every industry. So a lot of times you can head off formal information requests with some kind of meeting and engagement where you explain, here's really what, how our operations work, and therefore kind of head off the sort of longer, drawn out uh, document disputes. So in both ways, EPA has very strong authorities, but there are ways to sort of temper that and seek a better resolution. Brian, back to back to you. Is is are there defense tools similar in in Canada, and how is the defense of environmental prosecutions really dealt with in Canada? Uh, thanks, Tammy. Yeah, on uh, on an enforcement side, again, our regulators have very similar powers to what uh, to what Marshall just just described, and uh, and and again, uh, it's a question often of negotiating with them or uh, presenting a case in court if it goes into prosecution and. As, as I touched on earlier, at the heart of our system in terms of demonstrating um, and, 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 and responding to, to prosecutions or complaints is, is this concept of due diligence or demonstrating reasonable care. It is, it is, again, very much a common law, a judge-made concept. And you start off with complying with the statute is kind of your baseline. Uh, and uh, and, and, and if, you, uh, if you haven't complied with some specific part of the statute, then it's a question of, well, did you take reasonable care to prevent it? And perfection isn't expected, but there's no real clear roadmap as to what is sufficient at the end of the day. We, we look at a list of factors that go into what is reasonable and what is reasonable care. Uh, things like starting at the top, you know, corporate policy statements, is the board of directors engaged? Are they, are they providing the right financial uh, and governance tools to allow compliance with environmental statutes? Uh, is, is a corporation keeping up with industry standards? Uh, and then you get a bit more granular, you know, are employees being properly trained? Is there regular maintenance and uh, of equipment if there's any equipment involved? Uh, is it upgraded? Um, how does supervision go work in terms of the training? Um, is there enforcement of standards? Um, it, it's, it, it, it's often potentially quite embarrassing for a client when they say we have something like a disciplinary policy. You know, it's a progressive discipline and if it gets really bad, we can actually fire people. And then you ask them, how long have you had this in place? Oh, it's been in place for 20 years. How many people have you fired? Uh, none uh, is not a good answer. So you really need to show not only that you have these things in writing, but you're actually implementing uh, your stated standards. Uh, documentation is key, as always, in terms of showing due diligence, uh, because, uh, it, again, the paperwork is just so important when it comes to presenting a case to the regulator or even to the courts at the end of the day. And, and it's a concept of continuous improvement. So again, if, 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 if a company says we have had a system in place for years and it hasn't changed, that's probably not good. 
uh, you, you want to be able to show that you're constantly learning from near misses, uh, learning from actual incidents as well, uh, keeping up with developments uh, in other jurisdictions, using best available technology uh, when, when it's practicable, when it's available. So it, 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 it's at the heart of our system, and it's a difficult one to, to explain other than to say there's a long shopping list. The more of that list you can hit on, the more likely you're going to be able to show due diligence at the end. So one, one question I have, and uh, I'm going to go back to Marshall, you know, we're, we're talking about regulators in both jurisdictions, but uh, do we only need to worry about regulators or who else can seek enforcement? Sure. So many environmental statutes in the United States have uh, citizen supervisions, which means that individuals or environmental organizations can seek enforcement, usually in federal district court. Uh, without first going to the agency. Those provisions usually require uh, that they provide notice to the agency and the defendant before filing. They also typically require that the government is not diligently prosecuting uh, the matter. Um, and there are some instances where after that notice, the government may get involved, uh, but those are available under federal air, water, waste, and endangered species laws. I think in particular, those have really evolved in the last decade or so uh, where there's been a lot of activity under the endangered species laws and the chemical regulatory arena um, where organizations are really set up to monitor what EPA is doing um, and use kind of a dual track where maybe they're using citizen suits on the private side, but they're also filing petitions with EPA to seek further regulations. So there's sort of two tracks that environmental organizations use in that way to either get uh, court judgments um, for what they're seeking or try to force EPA to do the kind of regulation that they're looking for. There are also analogous state laws. I think the most commonly looked at is California Proposition 65, uh, which relates to chemical exposures. But we've seen consistently uh, with a lot of product regulatory matters, uh, plaintiffs seeking uh, uh, new claims under consumer protection laws, and then also for facilities um, and climate change related issues, uh, sort of novel theories under tort law. Sarah, let's come to you. And uh, does it work the same in, in Canada? Are there citizen suits, private prosecutions? Yeah, thank you, Tammy. And nice to be presenting with everyone today. Um, I uh, want to talk a little bit about the role of private prosecutions in Canada, we see that at the federal level and also here in British Columbia, Vancouver, where I am at the provincial level. Um, we combine that with some funds that are being established at the municipal level uh, for the prosecution of climate change related class actions, and as well, the private citizen claims against the government for failing to do enough. So, yes, we do see that, Tammy, in Canada. Um, just a private prosecution here is where a citizen lays a charge under the criminal code or the quasi criminal provisions of provincial or a federal environmental laws. And so what we see is the Attorney General has the right to intervene and take up that private prosecution where they feel it's appropriate to do so. And similar to what Andrew was saying, there are guidelines on how the Crown Council assesses and makes those decisions on whether or not it's going to continue the prosecution. Um, we are seeing, at least in BC, um, some uh, number of uh, private prosecutions laid against companies. Some are taken over by the provincial government, and others aren't. On the federal side, similarly, there is um, an ability to lay charges. We usually see that, as Brian has mentioned, on the coast, at least in terms of the Fisheries Act and um, either uh, depositing deleterious substances frequented by fish or har harming the fish habitat generally. Um, so there is also a federal policy. So just to kind of ground you in the facts here, I'll give you a couple of examples. We had a activist, Alexander Morton, who in BC launched a private prosecution for illegal possession of salmon under the Fisheries Act, and those charges were stayed. But we have other situations like the Lemon Creek spill, where there was a truck that deposited a volume of diesel into a fish bearing stream and that prosecution was taken over by BC. Um, so something to watch for if you are uh, you know, operating in, in Canada and in this jurisdiction. I'll just push one of our slides here, just the other two examples that I was referring to on the um, 
what I would call more of the the Vancouver City Council backing a, a climate change um, litigation. So let me just put that up on the screen. <clears throat> this is again um, specifically targeted um, for future um, climate change lawsuits. This is the setting up of a dollar per Vancouver resident for up to 700,000 to support potential class action lawsuits. It's directed really uh, towards efforts to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And then LaRose case got uh, quite a lot of traction in the federal court. It was struck down for um, failing to state a reasonable cause of action. But here you see kind of an activist movement on behalf of some young people alleging the federal government uh, has not done enough. And so um, all of those areas are something we watch for and we're seeing as emerging trends going forward. I just noticing the um, La Rose versus Her Majesty the Queen for the Americans uh, uh, watching us. Uh, federal cases are uh, named against Her Majesty the Queen as it was, I guess, uh, prior to uh, a month ago or so. And we will soon, if there are federal cases against um, uh, if there are cases against the federal government might be in his majesty the king's name next to uh, just a little it's a little fun for us okay let's we, we've talked about um kind of the 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 overview i want to talk um with the panelists now about the enforcement climate in each jurisdiction and um let's come back to andrew are we seeing a a new enforcement vigor in either country, um, well, in the U.S. for you, Andrew? Sammy, thanks for the question. Uh, we get that question quite a bit. The answer is yes, but it's really a two-part discussion um, of what has changed at the federal level, at the White House level, and what's descended from the White House to EPA and the other executive branch agencies. And then the other thing is what doesn't change so much from one administration to the next. So let's, let's take the first part, what has changed in the Biden administration here? So uh, day one of the Biden administration, the White House issued an executive order saying that it's the policy of the Biden White House to advance environmental justice and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to bolster resilience to the impacts of climate change. The order says that to that end, this order directs all agencies to immediately commence work to confront the climate crisis. So obviously very different language, very different uh, look in terms of the environmental agenda, the Biden administration compared to the prior administration. And so what the Biden EPA then did, Tammy, following this executive order on day one, is issued new guidance calling for enforcement offices to really double down on tough enforcement, including criminal enforcement. Mm -hmm. And that would entail things like making sure information is shared about the environmental impacts in environmental justice communities that face effects from nearby facility. So we have this tone set from early on and implementing policies that yes, we're going to strengthen environmental enforcement in this administration. So what do the metrics show so far, Tammy, in terms of penalties in the Biden EPA? Well, the most current full year info we have is for fiscal year 2021. And I should say that US EPA publicizes a lot of information about its enforcement results. They use a lot of different metrics to measure their enforcement. And of course that would include penalties. So EPA reported penalties totaling a little over $1 billion for fiscal year 2021. Okay, the Biden EPA reported this. And they compared that to 165 million in penalties for the prior fiscal year 2020. 2019 was, a 378 million, and then before that, FY18 was 74 million. So you could say, okay, the first year reported for the Biden EPA, there's a much bigger um, penalty amount. But that data has to be broken down, right? Because a significant part of the fiscal year 2021 Biden penalty numbers were accounted for by a few automotive cases under the Clean Air Act, which has been a priority here. And as folks can probably appreciate, enforcement cases have a long latency period, right? They originate well before the settlement is finalized, if it's a settled case. So that slug of cases that resolved in fiscal year 2021, of course, had origins before um, the Biden administration. Now, if you're interested to see these numbers in greater detail, you can literally just Google EPA annual enforcement results, and there's a whole page about it. 
So that's sort of the numerical side of this, Tammy. What about qualitatively? What are we seeing in terms of the enforcement approaches with this administration's and, and tactics? Well, one thing that's notable is for the first time in, in a while, US EPA issued uh, imminent and substantial endangerment orders under the Clean Air Act, which are generally pretty rare in the history of Clean Air Act enforcement. And uh, they accompanied those orders under the Clean Air Act with uh, a pretty strong press campaign to highlight the issues that EPA said it was addressing. They've also used the press, uh, they, they've used the media to tout other things like uh, a notice of violation, which ordinarily would be a more routine type of thing issued by EPA. And so that was notable because we generally wouldn't see a press release out of US EPA for a notice of violation. So I think numerically, you might say, certainly qualitatively, we're seeing uh, a different look on enforcement um, and what US EPA is highlighting here. So what does it mean if you're operating a, a, a regulated facility in this environment? It's, it's very challenging. And frankly, Tammy, it's been a challenging operating environment well before the Biden EPA, because if we think about basic technology, well, we have citizens out there, environmental groups who are uh, equipped with uh, things like this, their iPhones. They can take pictures of occurrences in their neighborhoods or near facilities that they might think uh, constitute environmental violations. And there's this sort of feedback system where citizens are sending that kind of information to US EPA to state regulators and the states are investigating, EPA is investigating that type of information. So the technology, the flow of information means that the in environment in which facilities operate is just inherently more challenging, I would say, even before we get to the Biden administration. And all this says that, uh, facilities really need to look at the lines of communication they have with their surrounding communities. It has to be done very thoughtfully. Um, and that can be done, Tammy, through things like community action plans here, where we have regular meetings with, with the communities to share data, to address questions that folks in the communities may have. And of course, that all has to be handled carefully because data can be misunderstood, um, particularly if you're talking to folks who don't have a technical background. So I, it really makes for a very challenging operating environment, just going into the administration and then with the administration's focus on tough enforcement. So I remember I said it's a two-part answer. Well, the second part is that, you know, things in some ways don't change a whole lot from one administration to the other. The White House changes, Tammy, because if we think about who is doing the investigation work, who is bringing enforcement cases, it's the dedicated career folks who work at EPA and the state agencies. And I think they would tell you that they generally go about their business, they develop targeting strategies based on a lot of data that they have, they decide to uh, conduct inspections now that uh, COVID has uh, lifted for the most part in terms of our day-to-day -day lives. And they develop cases, Tammy, based on whether they think they're actionable violations. And they're going to do that, um, whoever is in power in the White House. And so what all that means is, you know, we, we try to tell folks, don't pay too much attention. Don't vary what you're doing um, at a core level based on who's in power. I mean, you need to understand the priorities that the administration is advancing, who's ever in power, and you need to calibrate to that. But, you know, we have an expression here that comes from football down here, south of the border, blocking and tackling. You need to focus on compliance fundamentals day in, day out. And, you know, Brian used a phrase that US EPA itself embraces, continuous improvement. You know, the, the regulators here are gonna look for continuous improvement. So, you know, we often talk to our clients and their teams about that concept of continuing to raise the bar in performance, whoever's in power in the governor's office or in the White House here in Washington. And so I think it's that concept that you really just need to focus day in, day out on driving compliance. Um, whoever's in power and, and things will descend from there in terms of whether you're in a good posture to deal with any enforcement actions. Okay, so a, a lot to digest. Let's go to Sarah. Um, are, we, are we seeing changes in Canada? What's the current climate of enforcement penalties 
aggressive tactics. I don't know that that, that Canada is seeing um, regulators use social media like Andrew mentioned, but Sarah, take us to Canada. Thank you, Tammy. Well, I have to make a hockey analogy now since we're Canadian. You know, I would say spot the trend that the regulators are getting the puck in the net far more often than not now. We're we're seeing an increased number of fines over 1 million issued in Canada. And just recently, we saw an example of Tech Coal having to pay 60 million in fines, which is the highest fine ever imposed in Can a Canadian court for a violation of the Fisheries Act. So. I'll just push this to the audience here. It's a result of kind of a, some legislative changes in Canada. First, we have the changes to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which came into force in March, but it was followed by the Envo Environmental Enforcement Act. And so in recent years, as a result of those legislative changes, we're seeing um, some increase in fines and increased number of fines. Um, at the same time, there were some changes to the Fisheries Act, um, which kind of more broadly defined fish and fish habitat, and we're seeing some more penalties there. Of course, we have the companion Volkswagen case with uh, 196.5 million, the Dieselgate scandal in Canada that occurred in the U.S. as well, um, and also some pretty significant fines um, similar to the U.S. for migratory, migratory birds violations. Um, in terms of the what the regulatory climate is, um, we can see that, of course, we have a multi-layer jurisdictional system here in Canada, so that's why you really do need to know your regulator. We've got the federal um, uh, prosecutions um, and the federal government spending on those prosecutions. We have each separate province. We have three territories as well. Um, and when it says the local spend, that's referring to the municipal or the regional district spend. So you do see a slightly increasing trend from 9.5 billion to 12.6 billion in 2016. Subsequent to that, we are seeing um, increased government spending, not decreased government spending. Um, and then I'll just show you one other thing just to fall in line really with the climate change um, discussion. The Trudeau government here in July 2021 submitted a new um, target. And so it's 40 to 45 percent fewer emissions than in 2005 by 2030 and a lot of kind of increased um, funding proposed for low and middle income uh, nations uh, to reach their emissions targets. And then we're seeing, of course, this 2021 pledge to cap oil and gas sector emissions. Um, so when we look at what the government is spending, um, not just with respect to prosecutions and penalty regimes, we can see they also have um, a significant increase in the climate change mitigation adaptation funding, as well as carbon capture resource development. Um, so all of which is to say there's a ratcheting up effect of increased fines. As the fines increase, the baseline for assessing a penalty also increases. And we're seeing uh, some of the largest fines in Canada since the implementation of the changes to the Fisheries Act. Thanks, Sarah. And and, and while we're sort of still on this topic of, of the enforcement side, so Andrew, back to you. Are there are there local state versus federal differences in um, in penalties and enforcement? There really are, and in, 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 in the states here, you, you have to look at what US EPA is doing um, and and what it expects its 10 regions to do in terms of priorities and enforcement posture, Tammy. But then you, you really get to this sort of localized analysis where you have to look at the specific states where you're operating. So it, I'll, I'll take the EPA level first. What EPA does is it sets a series of enforcement priorities and it expects the 10 EPA regions to implement them, but it, it, it understands that the regions have different industries in their jurisdictions, and so it gives the 10 regions some autonomy. So, for example, now the, the US EPA has said it's gonna focus on Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act significant noncompliance. Now, the headquarters folks here in DC understand that in certain parts of the country, that's gonna mean a heavier focus on oil and gas facilities, for example. In, in other parts of the country, it, it might be a different focus in terms of the industry. And uh, EPA is also continuing to focus on automotive cases under the uh, Clean Air Act, the so-called defeat device cases uh, that Sarah also alluded to. Um, EPA is heavily, heavily focused on accidental releases from facilities. And so th those priorities at the US EPA level, Tammy, are gonna shape where EPA headquarters expects the regions to invest case development 
and case resolution resources. And to the extent that it gets litigated, um, their work with the Department of Justice, because EPA doesn't in the United States have independent litigating authority in federal court. It can take administrative actions and litigate in administrative tribunals, but it cannot litigate on its own in federal court. The state priorities are really driven by what, what the administration of power in that state at that time wants to do and really what are their key industries. I mean, if you go to a place like New Mexico now, you're going to see a suite of initiatives focus on addressing emissions from the oil and gas industry because that administration came in with a very specific agenda and decided to say we're going to really tighten up in terms of compliance monitoring. And so it's really state by state. And companies who operate down here, um, like I said before, have to really dial into their state regulators and in some cases the local regulators, depending on the program, and um, carefully study what their state regulators have as their environmental agenda. It, it, it may be different in some ways from US EPA. I mean, US EPA will meet with the states, Tammy, and they'll do what they call work sharing to sort of decide how they're gonna divvy up the, the enforcement work for a period of time. And they have these things called performance partnership agreements where they hash all that out. But the particular priorities or enforcement tactics, enforcement response initiatives in a state can be very different from US EPA and from a neighboring state. Um, and states have their own philosophies. Um, Tammy, when it comes to things like seeking large penalties versus trying to work things out more cooperatively. So it becomes very granular um, quickly. And then of course, we have states like California, Tammy, that have a particularly complex set of environmental regulations, uh, well, really laws, regulations, and policies. And as I mentioned, California was out ahead of even US EPA uh, on some aspects of the Clean Air Act. So um, all I'm gonna say there is thank goodness at Sidley, we have a dedicated team of environmental lawyers in our California office. In California. Uh, Sarah, back to you. So you mentioned this layering of uh, Canadian regulatory mm -hmm. agencies and, and are there differences when we talk about sort of federal versus uh, provincial? Oh, yes, certainly. And there's also uh, differences at the municipal level as well. So you really do have to know your regulator. Um, it really does help to get in touch with somebody in the jurisdiction where you're looking to get some legal advice from because, you know, even for such things as the difference between an inspection and an investigation and what your rights are there, that's something that usually um, you'll want to know what the intent is of that particular regulator. Um, similar to what Andrew was saying, we do have service plans for example, that are published on a kind of fiscal um, basis that talk about what the goals of the specific administration is at the time. So for example, in BC, the minister Heyman in this case would put forth what his goals are in strategic direction for the province. And so if you look at that, one of the objectives, for example, here in BC is talking about clean and safe water, land and air. And so there's a, a specific direction at um, some of the renewable companies that I, I work with, for example. So kind of the organic waste to energy type companies. So you need to know that when you're, you know, you're practicing or operating up in this, uh, this jurisdiction. And you need to know also what the specific uh, climate is like at the municipal level. We also have, um, at least in BC, the Greater Vancouver Regional District as well, which is uh, another uh, level of regulatory oversight that um, deals with um, such things as air contaminants um, and regulation of those through permits. Um, and so it really does help to know your regulator and to know what their strategic vision is for that particular year, yes. Terrific. And so we've talked about sort of like who the regulator is and, and what they're after. Marshall, let's come to you and address who is the target? Like who, who should really be worried about this? And, and while you're doing that, sorry, we have a question um, to put up Sarah's uh, slide on government spending again. So I'm just going to do that while you're answering. And if you need to switch slides, just let me know. But, but let's go to Marshall. Sure. Thanks, Tammy. So I think that we see this question come up in our practice in a couple different ways. Uh, the first is a foreign parent has a domestic operating entity that's either importing goods or operating here uh, and really operates on its own. It doesn't really 
um, maybe it shares some technology or some products with the parent, but really it has its own US based uh, compliance staff and operational staff. We have other clients who have a foreign parent uh, that really is the nexus that's ha handling globally compliance operations um, uh, across every jurisdiction. Uh, and we see that there's a delineation pretty strongly, I think, in US law uh, for most cases between the products based regulations, mainly related to chemicals and pesticides, and more facilities based regulations like air, water, and waste. So the, the product based regulations for chemicals and pesticides are usually much more tied to manufacture, import, or sale. And those are really domestically tied activities. And so I think there's a little bit less room in those statutes to pursue a foreign parent, depending on the facts. The facilities-based laws that we have typically refer to owners and operators uh, and for, for certain types of liability. And that's really an area where the, the term operator uh, can uh, encompass potentially either other domestic affiliates or uh, foreign affiliates or foreign parents. And we've seen in general that the trend in enforcement for pursuing uh, foreign parents has really come up where there's uh, the government finds that there's really substantial endangerment uh, to public health or the environment, or that it's very clear that the, in the second instance I mentioned where there's really the nexus of control is abroad, uh, that's really where the government uh, may pursue it. And the other key, I think, instance where we see that uh, going after a foreign parent is really where there's um, a domestic subsidiary that's now insolvent. And that's particularly, I think the classic example is in the contaminated site context. If you have a defunct uh, domestic subsidiary and you have potentially responsible parties looking for somebody to pay, obviously they will naturally be looking to foreign parents and looking for theories for either under alter, um, alter ego theories or others to find somebody who can pay uh, what they say is that, that liability. Uh, so we have found in general uh, that 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 liability is pretty different than the information gathering stage. So uh, in general, I think EPA uh, views its information authority uh, in contrast to what who's liable under the environmental statutes. I think EPA, especially in a settlement negotiation, thinks it has very broad uh, authority to get information. In particular, if you're in a in a cooperative posture, I think the agency is going to expect that you will provide. Uh, pretty fulsome documents and even communications potentially from the foreign parent. And so you have to be cautious about, uh, obviously there are benefits to cooperating with the government in an enforcement case, but I think it requires some uh, some caution about how, how to disclose those documents uh, and how to really brief uh, compliance staff in other jurisdictions about uh, how our environmental laws work because they may be much more used to EU or other regulations. So, of course, we're talking about, um, you know, U.S. and Canada, and we do a fair amount of cross-border work. Let's go back to Sarah, and in terms of sort of who's a target, um, are you seeing um, um, more sort of cross-border interest? Thank you, Tammy. Yeah, we certainly do. I mean, we have a number of um, U.S.-based clients um, who operate up here in Canada, and there was just... One case I wanted to quickly review with you, the Chevron case, just we're talking about um, enforcement of U.S. Uh, judgments or other foreign jurisdictions up in Canada. I think I wanted our audience to just be alive to it. Um, this has to do with the Ecuadorian plaintiffs, the 9.5 billion U.S. judgment um, that was granted in 2011 in Ecuador, and it made its way through our court system. But what you're seeing there is, in 2013, a, um, the plaintiff sought to enforce the judgment in an Ontario court, and um, it's against a seventh level subsidiary of Chevron, so that's how far they went. And in 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada it, did decide that Ontario had jurisdiction to hear the enforcement proceedings. So again, important to think about what is um, uh, exigible in terms of shares, and in that case, the court said, well, no, that um, doctrine of corporate separateness is going to apply. The expectation of, of stakeholders is that they need only consider the liabilities of that corporation and not the liabilities of all related corporations when doing business with them. And the court would decline to um, alter that. 
although there is a second basis, which is the piercing of the corporate veil and the arguments were made that it was just and equitable to do so. So our Ontario Court of Appeal um, disagreed and said that the courts are not going to disregard the separate legal personality um, when, and this is important, where it is completely dominated and controlled and being used as a shield for fraudulent or improper conduct, that story might be different. And that kind of alludes to something the speaker said earlier. And just lastly, I would say that there was quite a, um, an interesting dissent in that judgment as well, just to think about how the court's leaving open room for the piercing of the uh, corporate veil, really in situations where equi equity would demand a departure from the strict application of the corporate separatist, uh, uh, separateness principle. And so again, that's something to, to think about when you're structuring your operations. And as I think Brian had mentioned earlier, all the way down to the granular, granular level of you know, what, uh, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of who's the directing mind of the corporation um, and who's in charge of what your Canadian subsidiary is, is doing. Okay, so um, great, uh, great recap of, of those topics. Let's let's go into um, strategies for dealing with uh, current or past non-compliance, and um, let's go back to Brian on this. And what are some of the tools that you're um, using to address uh, compliance issues and the companies that you're working with? And um, I think early on Andrew mentioned the word proactive, so. So let's talk about whether we're proactive or reactive. Sure, thanks, Tammy. Um, you know, again, as 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 I mentioned earlier, the heart of our system is always going to come down to this concept of due diligence, and even when it comes to a compliance, that still remains uh, the fundamental tool that uh, your existing business needs to do to be able to demonstrate compliance, keeping up with the legislation, obviously, keeping up with your industry, uh, keeping up with trends and with uh, with new developments and, and new science and new, and new technologies as well uh, is is fundamental for for an existing business. Um, for for acquiring a business, if you're acquiring a new business, uh, probably the key tool at that point is uh, is a compliance audit, a comprehensive compliance audit of the existing operations, because sometimes the new set of eyes that the new owner brings to it will uncover things that maybe have simply slipped under the radar for the for the existing uh, business. Um, compliance audits are usually conducted under privilege and our solicitor client privilege, and our regulators tend to respect that. They recognize that there would be a chilling effect on these type of audits if they, uh, if they were to uh, not respect the, uh, the privilege at the end of the day. But of course, once the audit is completed, then the real hard work begins as to what to do with the results. And this is where you get into some of the more uh, potentially proactive type steps. Uh, uh, initially, uh, most responsible corporations, if they have a list of non-compliant items, uh, they'll quickly run through and try to look at a risk matrix. Uh, is there, you know, uh, is there a risk of, uh, of environmental harm? Is there a risk of employee harm? Uh, what are the consequences uh, of, of, of the non-compliance? And build up a list of uh, effectively a priority list as to what to do uh, with these. Um, with these items and develop a roadmap to come into compliance as quickly as possible. And this again, once you've done your audit, if you go back to that spectrum of liability, a rainbow of liability that Andrew was talking about, uh, once you know there is a non-compliance, you're into that knowledge. Uh, you're into that. I know that I'm not that I'm not following the law, and therefore it's really important to very quickly be able to show that you're doing what you can to come into compliance. Um, the, the other thing that you would do at the end of a compliance audit is also figure out, well, is there a mandatory reporting obligation or not to the regulator about this non-compliance? Um, from, a, from a legal advice point of view, uh, the easy answer is when there is such, a, such an obligation, because then you say to the client, yes, you have to report it. Uh, the really difficult questions are, is what if there is no uh, obligation to report past transgressions, uh, but you know that you've got some lead time before you can bring yourself into compliance. What do you do then? And this is where it's a really a case by case. A very difficult decisions have to be made uh, about approaching the regulators, uh, coming forward with a plan to come into compliance, coming forth with timelines, possibly opening yourselves up to uh, to um, uh, enforcement for the past transgressions at the end of the day. And again. Our regulators, as I suspect the regulators in the U.S. as well, 
uh, have stated policies in terms of enforcement, and uh, they obviously would look much more favorably on any type of voluntary disclosure with a plan than some kind of disclosure that happens because a third party complains or because the regulator find out. So, uh, you know, there is there is a big balancing act there, and a lot of it comes down to the relationship with the regulator, which I think is where we're likely to go next, Tammy. I think that's that's you know we've talked about the relationship issue quite a bit, and um, I think you know some of the tools you mentioned, uh, privilege audits, uh, are probably similar in the United States. So let's go to Marshall and um, uh, talk about relationships with regulators and how this really influences enforcement. Sure, I think that uh, as we've I think laid out a little bit already today, cooperation with. The regulator in an enforcement context is extremely important. Uh, it can reach better substantive results, but in particular, there are a variety of EPA and DOJ policies that provide for penalty reductions uh, for cooperation uh, and other provisions. And so it can end up being pretty important from the very beginning to build a very good relationship with the regulator, uh, especially even on informal direct terms to be able to get them on the the phone uh, and have direct and frank uh, discussions. And I think particularly in the regulatory approval context, that can be in chemical or pesticide approvals, can be in automotive certification. I think the, the number one problem we see some clients uh, find themselves in is that they have filed something, they really haven't followed up with the agency, and then there's a snag and they're sort of too late to get um, whatever approval they need. And I think the number one thing we find when we reach out to the agency is that they'll say, we wish somebody would have called us before. So really maintaining uh, an ongoing relationship uh, for any filing, any business you have before the agency, knowing who's looking at it right now, knowing what the regular stages are, and of course, uh, being very civil with the agency, understanding they're very busy people. Um, that can be a really key aspect to get something through uh, on time. And okay, let's go to Sarah because is is it the same in um, in Canada? And and do you have any sort of different scenarios where relationships uh, might be treated differently? Yeah, thanks, Tammy. I think we have a similar situation here in Canada as well. There's all the same mechanisms um, that Brian has talked about. But one other kind of relationship I thought I'd talk about now is with the Indigenous communities and where you operate. I'm um, just looking at the time and I, I want to make sure that our U.S. Uh, um, listeners are aware of this. So in Canada, we have a um, an Indigenous uh, communities that I'll just push this slide so you can get a sense. We had done some work internally with Miller Thompson to just identify who the Indigenous communities were and the neighborhoods in which our offices operate. And I think what you have to think about is if you're in a compliance scenario um, where you're working to bring yourself into compliance, what we do see is Indigenous communities becoming quite active in commencing either civil claims or challenging decisions of the regulator where they might um, permit or authorize um, an increased layer of um, pollution, perhaps in the form of an affluent discharge in the First Nation in the immediate jurisdiction doesn't agree with that. And so they are judicially reviewing or challenging the statutory decision maker. And so that's something you want to be very much alive to. And we, uh, a large um, part of my practice is focused on working with Indigenous communities, but also with proponents to try to bridge those relationships. When you're talking about project-based works as well, you might think that you've got, you know, this great project that you've invested all this money in, but you are running into some trouble with the Indigenous communities where you're proposing to construct this project. So if I'm thinking about Canada and I'm thinking about the number of treaty and in BC, of course, non-treaty nations and governments that we have, uh, and with the um, uh, really the recognition of UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is recognized here in Canada, um, that's another relationship that you uh, want to hold at kind of equal importance um, to the other regulators. 
So let's let's we've got uh, a little under 15 minutes left, and um, let's talk about some emerging trends because I know you all want to want to talk about that. Um, and let's go to, to Brian. I mean, a, a few of you have have obviously mentioned uh, climate related issues and um, at GHG, but um, what are you what are you seeing, Brian, in this uh, in this regard? Thanks, Tammy, as I search for my uh, unmute button here. Um, the, it, obviously, climate change is going to be a key in the conversation in terms of legislation and enforcement and, uh, and environmental regulation. What's interesting, at least interesting from a, from a legal point of view in Canada, is the implementation of this and, and, and the measurement and the conversations that are going to take place between the federal government and the different provinces as well. Again, you have the federal government um, uh, implementing, uh, or at least in a, uh, signing uh, treaties and making international commitments as to uh, Canada's um, commitments to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But because of our unusual constitutional um, allocation of responsibilities, most of the implementation of these treaties is going to come down to provincial action. And in that context, our provinces have genuinely different interests from each other. Uh, Alberta's interest in terms of its uh, resource and extraction-based economy is quite different from Ontario, which doesn't have that level of natural resources when it comes to oil, for example, and Ontario's energy is uh, is 50% hydro, and the other 50% is mostly comes from, from nuclear power. So how you how you implement these regulations is going to be quite uh, quite different across these provinces. And one of the problems that we might see, and we have seen uh, already, uh, when it came down to, for example, um, litigation by provinces against the federal government when it came to its uh, carbon tax uh, regime, uh, is, is, is you see different provinces measuring uh, their climate change uh, benefits uh, differently. And, and you know, uh, wouldn't want to use the term greenwashing, but there's a real risk that some of our legislation uh, could be accused of being greenwashing, where the labels all look good, but the practical implementation is perhaps uh, minimal in terms of its real impact. So I think that conversation is going to continue and they're going to become louder, and the debates internally within, within our country as to whether or not we are doing enough on climate change and doing the right things uh, is going to become a much more explicit, and in some cases a more litigious, um, uh, uh, um, environment. Uh, the, the, the other trend I want to touch on a little bit is obviously uh, emerging toxins continues to be uh, continues to be uh, something of, of interest to uh, to both the federal and the provincial government. Um, we've all, at least those of us in the legal sphere, we've all heard of PFAS and uh, and and that suite of chemicals, which is just starting to hit the radar screen, um, uh, both in the U.S. in terms of some notices to legislate, and in Canada, where we know the regulators are looking at it. Um, and there's other um, toxins as well uh, that, uh, that that will come up. This involves cross-border movement as well as internal use. Uh, Canada looks as much uh, to its own internal science as it does to developments at the US CPA level and also to the European Union, where, where sometimes the European Union might pick up on certain uh, toxins um, uh, ahead of the US CPA. And so Canada kind of takes, uh, takes a bit from all of them in the end in developing its own uh, Made in Canada policies. Um, so that, that's a, a quick overview of just some of the trends that we might uh, be seeing in the, in the near future, Tammy. Thanks, Brian. And Andrew, I'll come back to you. And I think, um, you know, Brian and, and Sarah talked about sort of coastal type uh, cases earlier, or coastal issues. Um, are you seeing trends in this area and, and others in the United States? Tammy, that's a great question. I mean, there, there are some very interesting cases that have emerged um, that are initiated by NGOs here in the states and in, in our northeastern uh, states, Massachusetts and Connecticut, where the NGOs are invoking the citizen suit provisions that Marshall talked about to try to bring about more stringent controls to address climate change impacts in coastal areas uh, specifically. And this is a great example of something that folks need to be attuned to is the, that the better funded and more sophisticated NGOs will use the citizen suit provisions to advance uh, very bold and in some cases um, very creative legal theories to try to get uh, measures in place where they think that the, the U.S. EPA or the states haven't acted enough. So they've advanced these theories, Tammy, um, to uh, try to get measures under the Clean Air Act and the Hazardous Waste Law 
atmosphere in the U.S. Uh, because they allege that the extreme weather that's happening, climate change, particularly impacts uh, coastal facilities and, and fuel terminals, for example. And what's interesting, Tammy, is those claims have gotten some traction in, in the federal district courts, although one um, was just dismissed uh, due to lack of standing. So what that really points up here is that you have to have a playbook if you operate here um, in terms of how to deal with citizen suits, how to engage very quickly with the group that filed the action to try to persuade them that their claims may not have as much strength as they thought, um, and you need to swing into action quickly. So when our clients get uh, notices of intent, as they're called, you know, we, we swing into action ourselves very quickly to try to address those claims. The other uh, big trend is environmental justice, and I know we're short on time. We have a slide deck that we're gonna have as a take home for folks who joined us today that drills down quite a bit into how environmental justice is being implemented by US EPA and frankly across the executive branch at the federal level. And the, the real takeaway there is that, you know, you need to understand how your facilities score on the EJ screening and mapping tools that the government has uh, upgraded fairly recently, because that will tell you where you sit in terms of prioritization uh, that EPA will bring to your facility in terms of whether EPA considers you operating in an environmental justice community and therefore subject to heightened scrutiny. And it goes back to the, the points we've already talked about. You need to also strengthen the relationships with surrounding communities, understand the community's perspective on your operations and environmental impacts to the community and uh, conduct that regular outreach. And the other thing that if you find yourself in a settlement discussion, Tammy, with US EPA, think about how the settlement can benefit the community. You know, what ways can the settlement actually try to strengthen the relationship? So again, we're short on time. There's a lot more that we've included in a slide pack on environmental justice. And we think folks simply have to understand that and understand how the government is using the EJ tools to rank their facilities. And just for um, for our, our listeners and, and viewers, we will be making the, the slides available. Um, but to pick up on something Andrew said, I'm gonna come back to Sarah just quickly, um, the relationships, and you, you did talk about citizen suits and indigenous rights claims, but um, benefiting the community. Can you, can you talk about that just for a minute? Yeah, I just wanted to mention too, like I'm speaking from the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh Tooth and Squamish nations. And so when we think about how, you know, environmental uh, projects have been impacted by that, we we think about um, Trans Mountain Pipeline, for example, where those three nations I've just mentioned were involved um, in long and protracted litigation. Um, the judicial reviews that I talked about earlier. We also see some of the communities such as the Woodsodan community where we, uh, we see opposition to the coastal gas link project. We also see a number of non-compliance issues being addressed by um, the First Nations in the community which those projects are taking place. So I talked about the citizen suits before. The one I hadn't mentioned was a Mount Polly prosecution after there was the tailings spill here which was a 24 million cubic meters of mine tailings, and it was a private prosecution, again, brought by the chief of, of the Hutzel First Nation. So, you know, that's part of what you need to be thinking about in Canada is we do have quite a number of very sophisticated First Nations governments here that um, you're going to need to, you know, consider um, as as a regulator, I think, as, as we move forward. Okay, and, and before we, we come to the end, we'll give Marshall a, a chance to talk about some emerging trends in the renewable sector. Uh, what are you seeing? Right, so I think that we, uh, when the current administration came in, I think we were very much anticipating the, the trends that Andrew talked about. Two, two unexpected trends that have really cropped up in our practice are renewable fuels and batteries. I think there's been, in, in the market, there's a great interest in renewable fuels. Part of that's driven by uh, federal California and British Columbia support uh, for renewable fuel standards. There's also a lot of interest in the aviation industry and sustainable aviation fuel. And that's been curious because EPA has taken the position that certain renewable fuels uh, and distillates are new chemical substances that need their own registration. So we've been advising companies uh, 
in the renewable fuel space on how to make sure that they're complying with federal chemical laws. And then similarly with batteries, we've seen a huge growth. Uh, it's only going to continue uh, with domestic battery manufacturing here. Uh, and those companies tend to use pretty innovative uh, idiosyncratic chemicals, which are new in the United States and need similar registrations. So it's sort of two areas where we've seen the push uh, related to climate change has really changed the industries in the United States and therefore really changed environmental practice. Yes, yeah, so we've had uh, you and Brian talk about emerging chemicals, and we could probably do a whole program on um, PFAS and PFAS. Um, but uh, that takes us to the end of the um, emerging uh, uh, issues in regulatory enforcement. And I really want to thank our speakers who've done an excellent job giving the audience uh, a tremendous overview in very complex matters. I think the, uh, the, 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 the message for our viewers is, it's a complex field, consult your professionals, and um, uh, sometimes that will involve some cross-border issues. Thank you to our audience for joining us. We hope you've learned something. We will make the slides available. Thank you to all the technical support who made this all happen. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to our panelists.